I guess I have a, a unique opportunity to know what it is to have nothing in Argentina. I never had a toy, never owned a ball, a little soldier toy, not a skateboard, not a bicycle. So when I came to the United States, I saw this like incredible, it seemed like Disneyland was literally where I lived. It was like everything was available. And I told myself someday I was going to work really hard to make sure that it had uh, enough to provide for myself and those that were less fortunate. Welcome to Dig's Influencer Podcast, the titans of real estate. The show that provides direct access to the real estate industry's top movers and shakers as they share invaluable insight on how to best navigate and succeed in any market. I'm your host, Warren Dow, founder and CEO of M3 Media and publisher of Diggs Magazine. In this episode, Alex Abad. Thank you to our show sponsor, Bo Concept. Let me introduce our guest, Mr. Alex Abad. Welcome to Diggs Influencer Podcast. Warren, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, man. So I'm looking forward to our chat here. But first, I want to introduce you to our audience. You're a successful entrepreneur. You've consistently ranked number one or two uh, top producing agent at Palm Realty Boutique in the last four years. You closed last year, 2017, over 100 transactions in residential and commercial. You have a lifetime sales volume over $280 million in real estate. You've been a big, big supporter of, uh, you know, community and charitable organizations. The Ed Foundation, you've personally contributed over, you know, $200,000 in uh, donations. You, along with Nick Schneider, were one of the founding members of Give Back Homes, which has had great success in giving back to the community. Nick is the one who actually brought me into and introduced me to Give Back Homes, and I'm extremely grateful for that. They're an amazing organization, and I'm just uh, very happy to be associated with it. And last but certainly not least, you are, in fact, what I call the de facto mayor of El Segundo. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we have an amazing mayor now, Drew, Drew Boyles, which don't, is a good friend of mine. Yeah, and, don't uh, get mad, Drew. I was just kidding. No, I mean that in the sense that you you are a real life, and, and this is the title of our podcast, you know, the Influencer Podcast. You are a real life influencer in the city of El Segundo. Oh, thanks, Warren. Well, it's about your legacy. It's about your home, and it's about your future, and it's about your legacy. So, yeah, I'm involved in every one of those aspects of life, today, tomorrow, and the future. So, Alex, tell us a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? Originally, we came from Argentina. My mom, my dad, 1968, we left everything. Of course, we didn't have much. At that time, my mom had to sell her shoes to put food on the table. And my brother and I, along with my mom and dad, we uh, made our way over to the United States, came into California, landed in Hawthorne. And that time, all my dad went to work uh, in El Segundo. And my mom uh, started working in uh, Hawthorne at that time. So, yeah, that's, that's how we got here. And at the age of about 10, 11, I found uh, Manhattan Pier and I started surfing at that age. Nice. And uh, that's when I, when I fell in love with the ocean here and, and the lifestyle. Manhattan was so different back then, right? Completely different. So different. Like night and day. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about your family. Yeah, you know, my mom and dad, uh, my mom was uh, in Argentina, was a concert pianist and a, and a music teacher. My dad had his own business for a long time until he couldn't compete with the government. And then everything went south from there, which created the, the need to, to make a change. And that's how we ended up here. They became extremely hard workers here in the, the U.S. And it was an opportunity for us to break the chains of poverty. And so they, they gave you know, me the opportunity to take the reins at some point to make a change. That's and right. they certainly did. So it's in your DNA, this... It is. I, I guess I have a, a unique opportunity to, to know what it is to have nothing. In Argentina, I never had a toy, never owned a ball, a little toy, sol little soldier toy, not a skateboard, not a bicycle, not a toy. 
you had to make your own little toys. You'd break up a little piece of wood, and that would be your little boat that would, you know, float down the curb to the end of the street. And that was, that was my toy. So when I came to the United States, I saw this, like, incredible, it seemed like Disneyland was literally where I lived. It was like everything was available. And I told myself that someday I was going to work really hard to make sure that it had uh, enough to provide for myself and, and those that were less fortunate. That's great. Great, great backstory there. So what did you do before you got into real estate? Well, before I got into real estate, my wife and I were fortunate enough to start a company years and years ago, which we held for 24 years, started with a $5,000 credit card, which then turned into a $5 million company. It was primarily a large janitorial company that had many different uh, divisions within that company from, from commercial, medical, uh, construction cleaning, maid service, and carpet flooring and construction cleaning. Wow. Some 5000 on the credit card to $5 million in sales. That's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, it wasn't overnight. It took some time. But again, it's a testament to the opportunity that somebody has here. Yeah. Uh, if you're creative, and if there's one thing I learned, is that you always want to create the change you want. Because nothing is, n- nobody owes you anything. Yeah. Uh, there's no entitlement. At least that was my impression. I had no entitlement. If I wanted something, I had to earn it. I had to create it. And so, again, it's a testament to the ability of, any individual having the opportunity to create something for themselves. And it, it, it did, you know, it took some time, but that's what we developed. And we were able to employ, you know, hundreds of employees and create a, a lifestyle for them as well. So it's, it, it goes pretty deep. So as you looked at starting and creating something, a business, was there anything specific that, that drove you to, to do the commercial cleaning type service? Or? Well, what led to that was in, in 1990, I was working for Hughes Aircraft, and I got caught in that massive layoff that, you know, thousands of people got laid off, and then you were out, you know, basically trying to compete for the same position with thousands of other people. So I told myself, I got to do something different. I had two little, you know, children at that time, and I felt that, you know, going into business for myself was the best thing to do. My wife, who is uh, an amazing, well, she's a cleanaholic, you know, she just loves to clean. And she had uh, this little side business of cleaning houses. And so on one end, I was actually working on developing a surfing magazine at the time, but it was a very expensive proposition. And she had this idea of creating a small little, you know, cleaning business. And and the probability of success was, was greater on her side than on my venture. So I put everything I was doing on the back burner, and they decided to help her develop that little side business into what I had no idea, which was like a lemonade stand that turned into a lemonade factory. Mm -hmm. Within six months, you know, she was generating over $100,000. Wow. So, yeah, it was really, really interesting. You know, when we sold our company, we sold 80% of it. I think that we were providing, uh, just even on on the house cleaning, we were doing 600 homes a month. Wow. Very impressive in the story that you're telling, I'm always, I always admire people that come from adversity, but more so the people that come from adversity that use it as a gift. Yeah. That really understand it. Right. And use it like, you know, your, your little piece of wood that turns into a boat and having that creativity and you have to make it on your own. You have to make it, you have to, nothing's given to you. And it's a good life lesson for everybody. It is. And it served me well, even in, you know, in the business that I'm in now, obviously, you know, well, we're not doing janitorial, although we sold 80% of the company and she runs the other 20%. Even in real estate, one of the key factors, if anybody's going to be successful, you always have to be in a constant state of creating. If you're not creating, there's a high probability you will not succeed in real estate. I mean, you can really break it down. And, and that's plenty of material for another podcast, but, but you really do have to be constantly be creating and i know that you understand that in the business that you're in yeah absolutely and tell me about a failure because we're talking about success but failure sometimes is the quickest and surest path to success right in a weird way sure Sure. have you had one or two or many i don't necessarily look at as as failing i've learned even when i was younger not to set myself up to fail but allow myself to, to start all over again. 
Yeah. And it wasn't about failing or falling, but to me it was always, how do I recover from this? How do I stand up, pick up the pieces, and make every step count from that time on, and then create what I really need? So those opportunities in life, when doors seem to just you know, shut right in your face, or things come crumbling down when you least expect them, they could rearrange your entire life. Yeah. They can rearrange your objectives and your perception. And if you allow yourself to learn from it, you come out a lot stronger, a lot wiser, and then you can handle any other quote-unquote failure from there on a lot more successful. I agree. The failures, they're exceptional opportunities to learn. Right. Exceptional. And, and, and it's the best kind of learning. Of course. You know, because you can read and study. But when you do and, and you fail, you learn. And, and hopefully you don't do that or you do it a little differently on what you've learned. Right. Well, it's, it's not a natural feeling, right? So nobody wants, to, nobody wants to fall down. Nobody wants to get hurt. You know, I raced motocross. And if you want to complete a course... Uh, in this case, I race tracks mainly. In tracks, there's different parts to every track. And there's jumps and there's tabletops and there's doubles and so on and so on. And they will challenge your ability and your skill set. And it's not whether you're going to fall. It's when you're going to fall. And you just know that there's going to be some collateral damage maybe. But then you're going to learn from that. You're going to learn about, you know, how fast you have to take that jump the next time so that you can clear it. And when you clear it, your landings are just super smooth. It's really nice. But when you come up short... Um, ouch. Ouch, yeah. <laughs> so, like, when did you get your real estate license? So, my wife and I decided to make a life-changing decision to sell the company that we had. We ended up selling 80% of the company in 2003. Then I took about a year year and a half off of basically not doing anything except what I really wanted to do. A lot of surfing, a lot of traveling, and, and then to begin to decide what I was going to do f- from here on. Real estate was something that I've always enjoyed because a part of our business before that was providing construction cleaning to a lot of basically 90 to 95% of every new home that was built in the South Bay our company was doing the construction cleaning. So I interacted with the contractors and the real estate agents. So I knew a lot of the, the uh, agents who were already in the business for many, many years as a result of my previous company. And I loved what they were doing. And I thought that was fascinating life and business and so on. So I, I decided at some point, you know, I think I'm going to get my real estate license. I have no idea. I had very little knowledge about it, but I think I like to do that because I'm I'm somewhat of a people person, and I ended up getting my license in 2005. And then I called Jack Gillespie, who was with South Bay Brokers, owners of South Bay Brokers at that time, and I asked him who he recommended I hang my license with. So they brought me on board and said, no, we, we'd like you to you know, hang it here. So I did. But again, my perception of what I needed to do in real estate was completely different than what their requirement was for an agent. For me, if I, I thought, hey, you know, if I can just do maybe one transaction a year or two, I'd be, I was going to be very happy because I was in a position in my life where I didn't really have to sell real estate to make a living. That was not the business model for South Bay Brokers. And they, they clearly stated to me that it was going to be, you know, you're going to spend a lot of hours and we had nobody that performed in, in, in that little of a, you know, that just wasn't going to work. <laughs> so actually, I was disappointed. I actually went home and told my wife, I don't know if I want to do this because I know, I know the type of person that I am and it sounds like I'm going to have to just like dive in. And, and, and there's only one way for you. It's all, all in or nothing. I'm either really all in of, yeah. or not. It took me about almost a week. I had to like digest the whole thing. Do I want to just throw myself into it? And I ended up deciding, you know what? I'll throw myself. I'll give it 100%. I have no idea what the outcome is going to be. But at least I know that I'm giving it all. And here I am. So how long did it take you to, for your first sale? Tell, and tell us about that. It, t- it, it only took me within the first, I think, uh, month that I was involved. Because I had a lot of connections. And people knew who I was and the quality of, in, of individual that I was. So they knew that with Alex, they knew what you're going to get. 
For South Bay Brokers, the first year I was Rookie of the Year. At that time, South Bay Brokers had 150 agents approximately. And I uh, was Rookie of the Year the first year. The second year, I had another great year. And I think within within the first three three years, I was in the top 25 there. And then shortly after that, I started in Manhattan Beach off of Sepulveda there. And then uh, I decided to open up an office in Hermosa and Nick Schneider and myself got and involved in doing met. that. Yeah. And that's where we met, exactly. Yeah. And then shortly after that, I decided to open up another office in El Segundo. And that put you on a whole nother trajectory, right? It did. Um, so tell us about your decision to go back to where it all started in a sense and to focus and say, this is going to be, you know, my turf kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So it's an interesting decision because when I first started in real estate in 2005, the, com- the market was kind of on a downward trend and and yet El Segundo was known for being very cliquish, very tight, extremely tight. And so I didn't start out in El Segundo for that reason. I wanted to start out in, you know, in the quote unquote, the larger area of the South Bay and allow myself to be established. And and I thought I had accomplished that over the four, four or five years. And then I decided to to establish most of my business, if you will, in El Segundo, because that's where I lived and that's where I raised my kids. They went from, you know, kindergarten through high school there. So I was also known in the town, and I felt that I was going to have a, maybe a good opportunity there to kind of build a, a pretty decent real estate business there. Not everybody thought that, though, because it's such a small town with an average listings, a number of listings. At that time, it was probably anywhere between 12 and, and 22. And then it, as the market got better, average number of houses for sale, it averaged between 8 to 11. Sometimes it was only like five homes for sale, single family homes in the entire town. So, you know, when you have 24 agents, you know, you have to really consider who's going to be making a living. But interesting enough, El Segundo has been very, very good to me. You're now working with your daughter, Amy. Yeah. So Amy came on board and uh, this is now her, she's going on her maybe third, third, third year, fourth year with me. She's full-time. She's a mother of four beautiful little girls, and she's doing tremendous. She's doing just great. Hard-working mom. So did you recruit her, or did she, she see the success and say, all right, Pops, teach me? It's not like recruiting. You know, right, you know what I mean. I, yeah. I can see her talent, and she's an amazing individual with tremendous people skills. And so at that time, she was managing the good stuff in El Segundo. And everybody loved her, and everybody loves her, period. She's just like a ball of sunshine. So I told her, I said, hey, you know, why don't you, you know, why don't you get your you know, real estate license and, and come, come work with me full time? I think you would do really well. So she did. She's a really good learner. And I've had the opportunity just to sit with her and teach her a lot of things that, I, that I've learned. And she's a really wise, really sharp, and doing, no, doing really, really good. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it is. So here's you know a question I like to ask, and yeah. you know I've probably asked this to you before in our travels, but like what differentiates you from you know everyone else? I think what differentiates me is that it's the quality of the brand. You know, the business of real estate has nothing to do with selling houses. Selling houses is the byproduct of real estate. The business of real estate is you. You are the product. There's over 3,500 agents in the South Bay. If you were a ketchup bottle in an aisle in the supermarket and somebody's looking for some ketchup, you have to decide how you're going to stand out in that aisle with 35 other ketchup bottles. And so the business of real estate is you becoming such a product that at the end you become the chosen one. So that means you have to be highly likable, highly desirable, highly knowledgeable. Obviously, you have to be trustworthy. And so you have to have all of that, and it just doesn't happen. Some things, you either have them or you don't have them. But what makes me different or separate is that I I really strive to be the best. I have really no desire to be 
the biggest, even though sometimes we agents like to qualify themselves as like, you know, number one, so on and so on. I, I really kind of like shy away from that. I really want to be known for being the best. And I really do believe, and this may sound kind of weird, but it's not meant to sound odd. I believe that I am the best at what I do above others. If I did not believe that, I should be referring somebody else for the job. I love it. You know, and, and you and I align in so many different ways. Alex, when we first met, we talked about brand. And, you know, we have the same mindset in that, you know, the ketchup bottle analogy. In this day and age of connectivity and digital and shortcuts and content and video and podcasts and social media and blah, 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 blah. It's like everyone's looking for the quick fix, the quick, you know, success. And the old school has never been more the new school in the sense that brand right. is, it's always been about brand and about differentiating. And it's always been about trust. Right. Any transaction, any industry, you need to earn trust. Right. And, right. and brands have always demonstrated the ability to do that better than any, anybody or anything. And, and thus they have repeat recognize, you know, they're recognized and repeat customers and what have you. But it's far and few in between that, that agents in this business recognize the importance of that. Yeah, you're right. And, and what happens is that, and I see it in a lot of agents, especially young, young agents, they, they want to get to quote unquote, the top super fast. They want to get in and I mean, who wouldn't, right? But it's, real estate is one of the hardest things you'll ever do. The business of real estate is the hardest thing you'll ever do. It's the type of business that is probably the business that you're going to spend a lot more money in just about anything else. That sometimes you don't see tangible results immediately. And it's, it's the type of business that sometimes you only have about five minutes not to get somebody's email and phone number, you got five minutes to get their trust. If you can get their trust, you probably have an opportunity to get their name and, and, and phone number. But what I see, it's, it's sometimes it's backwards. People want to get people's names and numbers, and, and that's really not the way to go. At least for me, it isn't. It's not so much what you say all the time. It's what you do. And, you know, you've got a great quote. I don't know if this is your exact quote, but you've said your greatest achievements are the things you do for others. Correct. And that is my quote. So great. So And that, that's what I live by. You know, Diggs and myself have the same sort of mantra in that it's always about for to get someone's time and attention and or ability to earn trust, you have to exchange value. You have to it has to be about, you know, value and, and doing it just as you as your quote for others, not for yourself. Right. That segues into your, you know, which I think you've done a great job with this whole the Tower 60 thing, which I want you to talk about, but that embodies really something you're doing for the community, creating a, a value exchange and, you know, something that's, that's for the community. Tell right. us about that. Sometimes people ask me, what's your greatest achievement? You can break them down because it's not just one thing. You know, there's personal achievement. There's an achievement as an entire, you know, my whole life. But in a nutshell, for me, my, my greatest achievement is looking at my life and recognizing how I've, I'm giving back, what I'm giving back. My greatest achievements is not what I've earned, it's what I've given away, what I have given back. That's my greatest achievements. So I evaluate my greatness by what I give, not by what I get. And I pray that I continue to do well because the more that I can get, is the more that I can give. And that's just the way that this little kid who grew up with nothing has decided to function in today's world. It doesn't work for everybody. It's my life. It's my little story. You know, but that's the way that I've kind of set it up for myself because that's what makes me feel really good. And so, so yeah, so that's, that's really the way how I interpret, you know, my greatest achievements are the things that I do for others. Yeah, that's powerful. That's great. And, and I think this is why you and I align on so many different levels, because I think we go to market in the same way. 
And, you know, we always want to be in a position to give more value than we ask in return. Right. That feels good. <clears throat> you know, you want to feel good about what you do and be passionate about it. And right. that's a great thing. Right? right. It never gets old. Yeah. I'd rather people look at my life and say, oh, not so much like, oh, wow, look what he's got. I, I would rather them look at me and go, oh, I can't believe he did that. Uh, he just, he, why does he do that? You know, yeah. I would rather have that perception than the other. Looking for a personal stylist for your home? Check out Bow Concept. One of their design consultants can help you make the most out of your space. No request is too big or small for living, dining, sleeping, home office, and outdoor spaces. And check out their Southern California showrooms in Orange County and Costa Mesa and also in Los Angeles and La Brea. For more information, visit Bow Concept at bowconcept.com. Email info at bowconcept.la. How important do you think it is to have local market or and or neighborhood sort of knowledge? It's extremely important. And that's the part of the brand that has to have the knowledge. Because if you're knowledgeable, then you are desirable. And if you're desirable, then you're likable. And if you're likable, it just, it just feeds itself. So you have to have the knowledge. You have to be, be able... And I'm not talking about information, because we're all swimming in an ocean of information. You have to be able to provide knowledge about something that's specific to that individual who may be considering an area, a home, or they're looking for one, but they don't have the knowledge. And so knowledge is powerful. And so given the area that I work uh, in, or I farm in, using those words that people may understand, I have to be extremely knowledgeable about the, the business end of the area, the residential aspect, the educational aspect, I mean, all the way around to be able to provide someone enough information so that they can make a good decision. Because at the end of the day, we don't sell anything. I don't sell anything. I provide the best possible information by which someone can actually make an intelligent decision. And then I'll help them through the whole process. What kind of advice, like if you were a seller, someone, Alex, I'm considering selling my home, what, what advice specifically would you give them? In today's market, like right now, and what we're going to be probably, you know, navigating into, one of the most important things as a seller is going to be price. Because things have changed. They've been changing now for a little while, but they've certainly changed. And we're going to be probably looking at additional changes coming into 2019. The rise in interest rates, the larger amount of you know, inventory that's sitting on the books, if you will, all this creates a more unaffordable situation for a buyer and a, a much more competitive situation for a seller. So pricing is going to be extremely important. And then making sure that you, the product reflects the appetite of the consumer is going to be just as important. You just can't say, well, you know, there's so many buyers that can just put up a sign and, and they'll go ahead and engage your house. I think the times have changed. So let's talk about El Segundo because, and this could be a separate podcast, as you know. Yeah. But El Segundo is, is creating its own, you know, unique story. And it's wild, right. you know, in, in, in a good way. Right. But um, tell us about, we touched on it, you know, it's low inventory. It's, you know, 10 to 14 homes that are available at any given time. And there's about, what, 5,000 homes-ish? Uh, uh, yeah, you're correct. Uh, 5,000 residences, right? So El Segundo is transforming, though, with all the, you know, the commercial and the Sleepy Hollow and, and uh, the Lakers new training facility and the Rams coming in and, you know, all the Fortune 500. And tell us about what's happening there, because it really is unique. Yeah, what, what makes El Segundo unique, obviously, is that it's a, it's a coastal community. Uh, for many, many years, has been, you know, kind of like off the radar and even off of like the map, if you will, the real estate map. Uh, certainly in the last several years, El Segundo has become a, kind of a really, you know, great destination for people to start looking at and an option for them as they're looking for housing. And now the last, I would say, couple of years, El Segundo has been it. So we, you know, it's things have really just changed. The, the socioeconomic side of it 
The demographics has changed as well. In El Segundo, it's a small town, amazing community with incredible schools, but it's also like a, a giant when it comes to industry. And we've had some conversations with regards to the quality of the type of industry that, that's coming to El Segundo. Uh, I, I've mentioned to you before, we've, we've had in the last two years now, two and a half years, nearly 200 new companies come into El Segundo, from small to medium to large size companies, but nearly 200, and most of them are high-tech companies. So it's become a, a hub, a mecca for the high-tech industry. So that obviously creates a tremendous amount of strength as it relates to the, the desire or the appetite for housing, whether it's for ownership or for tenancy, right? That people need to live somewhere. So El Segundo is poised to continue to be like an amazing place for people to, to reside in. And it's been, it hasn't been off the radar, but it's been sleepy to say, yes. to use the Sleepy Hollow. You know? Right, which is actually Smoky Hollow, but... I mean, Smoky, we, we yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Sorry. Oh, geez. <laughs> I should know. Smoky <laughs> Hollow. Yeah, Smoky Sleepy Hollow. I meant to say Sleepy Smoky. Um, and the pricing has gone through the roof. And it, it's South Bay and everywhere, you know, SoCal has, has gone crazy. But, but El Segundo, because of its unique sort of constraints. Right. Because it's so small. Um, pricing has gone really exponential. What's the median home price now, roughly? Median price, or for or now it's probably a, a million four. A million four. Uh, it was a year ago, it was like a million five. So it's changed a little bit. Dirt. In El Segundo, you know, an average 5,000 square, 6,000 square foot lot. So just the dirt value alone is a million dollars to a million four. And about five years ago, I'm just going on my memory here. Yeah. About 800,000 right. maybe for me. Correct. Median. Yep. 750 to 850 medium. So just crazy growth. Right. Exactly. The opportunity has opened up for a lot of the builders because, you know, for many years, since 2006 till last year, there was very little spec building. You know, contractors weren't building in El Segundo for spec homes because the city had changed the requirements in 2006 and then just killed all the new construction. But and now you're breaking records like well over two, right? Two million? Yeah, so two million. Home? Yeah, we actually have one that uh, we just broke ground on it. So it's brand new house, brand new construction. Uh, it's sold before. I mean, we just broke ground, so there's no house there, but, but you know, a building in its way. Two million, five hundred fifty thousand. So it was sold before. And that's a record now? No, that's not a record. There's, um, we just had another one that was uh, sold for uh, a little over $3 million. Yep. Wow. So you broke the three. The yeah, we're crushing three. it now. So, we're, yeah, we're... Uh, Next up is five. Let's well, do it. Well, you know, it's, in, it's, it's, it's really a great opportunity for, for builders because you can still get the land for a good value. Well, and we've created, like, yes, the market's slowing down. Yes, there's cycles, all this stuff. But, like, the South Bay including El Segundo and Silicon Beach. Right. There is so much wealth coming in and so much industry um, that's backfilling, you know, inclusive of sports, you know, Rams and, and YouTubes building that ginormous, the Spruce Goose, uh, Goose Hanger that they're... Correct, yeah. They're, they're populating now with their whole YouTube thing. I mean, it's just endless. So these people have to live somewhere. And El Segundo is really literally the axis. It's right in between. It is. We got the old Raytheon facility that... It's being converted into a, uh, it's a 20 acre, 300,000 square feet, creative office space campus. That's, that, that's in the works right now. There are multiple, you know, high tech creative office spaces that are being finished now. There's about a, over a billion dollars in construction in El Segundo right now. So El Segundo is, is humming. So that, that's going to create a lot of strength for our local real estate market to kind of like, you know, it, it'll just support what we have here. So I think for the next couple of years, we're looking at a pretty decent real estate market. After that, I really, I don't have a crystal ball now, but I certainly can't see after two years, but we're going to have a, we'll continue to have a strong market for the next couple of years, but certainly also some make some adjustments as well because of, uh, because of interest rates. Yeah. yeah interest rates are definitely, I mean, as you know, the, the real estate leads, you know, recessions and leads, you know, booms or, yeah. you know, recovery. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we're we're leading indicator both on the down and the up. Yeah, exactly. But interest rates are something to really pay attention to. And the affordability, like that's the biggest sort of, you know, 
topic of discussion besides interest rates. In right. And state. I think over the years, you know, as, as prices have gone up, if you think of it, you know, you, you got this chart on one end, you got prices going up. On the other end, you got buyers who are climbing as well to meet the high values, right? At some point, it begins to cancel itself out where it's become unaffordable and, and people get priced out. So they stay off of the buying pool, if you will. They think that, well, this, this bubble is going to burst at some point and then we'll jump in. Well, there's really no bubble to burst here because the circumstances are quite different than the previous circumstance we had. But yeah, but it cancels itself out and, and the air up there, it's pretty thin. That plays into every price point. So whether it's a first-time buyer who's looking between, let's say, you know, nine hundred to a million two, or the guy who's going from a million five to a million eight, and so on, from two million to two million five, all those peaks get pretty thin. So I think the small adjustment that we're going to have now is going to create more of a normal market, where buyers are going to feel like they uh, they they have a little bit, not so much an upper hand, but they they have a little better opportunity to negotiate a little more breathing room yeah absolutely and what's wrong with three three and a half percent appreciation every year oh nothing i mean no, on, a, on a million dollar asset uh, no it's 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 amazing yeah people, buyers still have to look at the long term right it's a great time to buy some of the buyers are holding off to see what happens with regards to the business side of it the commercial side of it el segundo has been voted for two years in a row the friendliest business city Second, it has, for a business, some amazing tax advantages. We have the lowest business taxes out of any city. The lease rate per square foot, where the average price, like in Santa Monica, could be you know, over $5 a square foot. In El Segundo, it's like three thirty dollars a square foot. So it's very appealing for companies to come into El Segundo because... Logistically speaking, they're, they're right there. They're, they have easy freeway access, tremendous hotels for their employees. They have tremendous schools, uh, access to the beach, the quality of life. So it's very, very appealing for a lot of these companies. And El Segundo has been underutilized to a degree in the, in the sense that it had land to develop. Right. It had, you know, it had space. Right, correct. It had, it had a city willing to get creative and be be supportive of that growth, which is unique. That's right. Yeah, you know, it, it, it still remains to be the aerospace capital of the world, although the aerospace has changed. It's going from aerospace to high tech. And so the opportunities for El Segundo and its growth, is, it's just amazing. There's still a lot of available space in El Segundo. Playa, they they ran out of available commercial space. So they're tapped out. That's why that... Silicon Beach movement has moved over to El Segundo as well. Let's talk about the Tower 60 sort of phenomenon yeah. that, that you've created again, because I think it's a powerful lesson for, and it, it embodies sort of who you are as a person, but there's also a sort of a powerful marketing story there in that if you're doing something for community and or creating value around a community, right? Um, you're in essence creating a brand, whether you know it or not. So, tell us a little bit about that, like the origin story of that. Tower yeah, 60. so that it's it's really amazing how this whole thing turned out. It, it started with a photograph I took in 2016, and in 2016 we had the uh, fires in the valley, and it created some of the most amazing sunsets because of the. And by the way, I remember when you showed that photo to me on your iPhone. Yeah. Well before Tower 60. You said, check this out. And I was like, whoa. (laughs) Right. So that photo, it was so likable that I think I posted it one time. And and I had requests from people from all over the place. Hey, can can I get a copy of that photo? Can I get... So I did. I sent it all out. And it became, you know, again, just a really cool photo. I think I took over 50 shots with my iPhone, trying to get the sun in the right place and so on. And... And, and I picked the one I thought was the one I liked. That Christmas, uh, my wife said, you know, so what are you going to do for your clients? I said, ah, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. Uh, she said, see, she's the one who suggested, why don't you go ahead and take that photograph, put it in some really nice coffee cups, fill the coffee cups with chocolate kisses or whatever, and uh, send them to your clients as a little gift and, you know, with a nice little card. So I said, okay, I, I, I guess if it's not too corny, I guess we can do that. So we did. I sent it to all my clients, and I also created a photo of the mug. 
And then people begin to ask me for the mugs from all over, from all over, from Hawaii, from Colorado. So I found myself having to make more cups. And I think we, we, we gave away thousands of cups. And mm-hmm. I shipped them all over the state. So <laughs> it now, cost now me more to ship it than, to, than anything else, but they wanted it. So I, I, I now gave you're in the merchandising them. business. You're like, wait, oh, how do we get, well, how do we, what, what happened? It, it really was. And then, and then we decided, well, I think it might be cool to maybe put it on a hat. And someone made the silhouette off of the Tower 60. And by the way, Tower 60 is the El Segundo Tower. That's where the 60 comes from. It happens to be the tower, the lifeguard tower, at the very end of Grand on El Segundo Beach. And so we ended up getting the silhouette done and we put it on a bunch of different hats. And then I started like giving away the hats. So I promoted that through, you know, Facebook and and, and social media and different avenues. And then it, it just went crazy. I mean, people were coming in every day. Somebody would come into my office every day to get a hat. And we did that for about almost a year. And we ordered thousands of hats. And then we got more creative with the hats. And then what happened was it got so crazy that I felt that, well, if people really want the hat, then maybe I can leverage it and then we can raise money and I'll give 100% to charity. The other aspect of it that organically, it became a symbol for El Segundo. Yeah, it became an. It is now. It, an it iconic, is now. It became really an iconic symbol for El Segundo. It is. Yeah, it's it's really interesting how that that that's happened. And so it wasn't something that, that I planned. The one thing that I did plan uh, was that I wanted to make El Segundo a little bit more beachy, because we are a coastal community. But I noticed uh, that for El Segundo, you tend to see the airport, the refinery, the water tower. It's all good, but it, it doesn't really create this like beachy lifestyle that I'm used to. You know, I mean, I grew up surfing what they refer to as a jetty now, but it used to be the oil pier. I used to surf the oil pier when I was young. So for me, I wanted to see if I could actually pull the beach up into the town in a weird way, that's what Tower 60 did. It actually made El Segundo a little bit more beachy. And indirectly, people began to uh, take ownership of the Tower 60 as part of part of what it, rep- you know, it kind of represents El Segundo. Yeah. And you so, tapped an emotion in the, in the city. Yeah. And, and the community. Correct. To the point where even the city asked me for some of their events to donate hundreds of my hats. We just had this year also the, I got a letter from the Los Angeles County Fire Department, which oversees the LA County beaches. They requested nearly 200 of the Tower 60 hats to be given away to all our lifeguards at an event. It's such a case study for marketing. It wasn't like you you were trying to, to build this master marketing plan or strategy. No, it was totally altruistic from the first instant. Right. And it was authentic from the first instant. And it was not about you. It was about the community. And, and it all comes together. And then look what happens. You know, I can say for the success we've had with Diggs and, and the brand that we've created, it's been the same. It was never about me or what I wanted to do. It was always about looking at life through your lens, being like, if I was a realtor, what would I do? What do I need to grow my business? Right. And right. And having the vision to try to create that. Right. Um, and, and it takes on its own life. It does. And sometimes these, those are things that it's, they're, they're hard to plan because if the, you have a specific objective, it may not turn out the way you want it. Sometimes things turn out organically in a way that you never really saw it. But you, you, you have to recognize it at some point and go, okay, great. So now that it is this, what can I do with it? And what we decided to do was, one, I've never put my name on any of the merchandise. So... It's just the Tower 60. It doesn't say Alex Abad Real Estate Group or anything underneath it, unless I'm specifically marketing my business. But all the merchandise doesn't have my name on it because I don't. I don't want. I would never wear a hat with somebody else's name on it, unless it said you know Billabong or Nike. Except or for it said like my name, right? If Didn't it said Diggs, I'd, you know exactly. <laughs> but but yeah, so I've 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 purposely kept my name off of the hats for those reasons. But 
the logo has become such a desirable, iconic thing that in eight weeks we raised twelve thousand dollars, and they're all like twenty dollar donations. So in just eight weeks, two months, we raised over twelve thousand dollars. And then when we did one with the American flag on it, or the colors of the American flag, in four days, that raised $3,500. And I give 100% to the El Segundo Education Foundation, because that's where I'm at, right? And during the summertime, I will give the hats away to charity and for special events. And during the times where in school is back in session, then I'm always taking a donation for it. And, and it probably raises hundreds of dollars Every month. It's a beautiful thing, you know, and, and you've heard me say this, Alex. I'm a firm believer in, you know, one of my favorite borrowed quotes is, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah. And uh, you embody that. And, you know, and, and that's like your gift to El Segundo. And they give back, you know, and, and, uh, and supporting you and, and what you do. And it's enlightening and it's inspiring. Thanks, man. Congrats. So with some closing thoughts here, Alex... A couple fun facts. We have a lot in common. Did you know? <laughs> There's a few things we have in common, for sure. But I'd well, like to know which ones, uh, did, which did, ones you did, have written down. These ones? Okay. So, <laughs> did you know we both immigrated to the U.S. when we were young children? I didn't know that. See? Wow. Yeah. I got you, huh? Wow. That's... So, uh, I, when I was two and a half years old, I'm a Canadian from Toronto, Canada. Wow. And so, my parents relocated out here when I was two and a half. Wow. So, wow. yeah, we both love to surf, been doing that for a long time. Yep. And we're both extremely cool guys. Well, you know what? We, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Boy, scratch that. That was a joke. That was a joke. No, I think if you, you know, I think if you surf, there's a high probability you're going to be a cool cat. Yes. It's just the, you know, keeping it mellow and keeping it real, right? Yeah, exactly. So, We've covered a lot today, and I want to thanks for your time. But let me let me ask you a closing question. Go for it. What is something that people would be surprised to know about you? Hmm. Is there anything like, wow, I would have never guessed this about Alex? Well, there's probably a few things that people don't know about me. Now, some people do know what I looked like in high school, and it's nothing like I look like now. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that leaves a lot of imagination. They would be surprised to know that I was referred to as Methuselah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need to hear more about that. What, what's that. what is that all about? You know, the 70s was all about the hair. Oh, yeah. And so I had, my hair was very curly. <laughs> and some of the guys who surf, and they know like buttons, you know, from Hawaii, they would think I was Roger Daltrey. So you had the do of all do's. I had a really long curly, and it was all bleached out because all I did was just surf. So I think that uh, that would be one. It would be shocked to see a photo of me when I was in high school. I can make it available if they really want me to. They'll get a really good laugh and a good kick. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And I think some of the other things, you know, I'm a pilot. Well, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. a licensed pilot? Mm Mm-hmm. And do you fly, like... Just, Still? yeah, small little planes. And then, you know, my son, Alex, he started flying airplanes when he was 14. So he's a corporate pilot now. He flies Gulf Streams all over the world. He's like super gifted. He's a lead captain on a G4. Wow. Um, so, yeah. So those are little things that sometimes people don't know. I don't have a college degree. Barely graduated high school. Cause you know, and, and, you know, means it, it so means nothing in the sense that some of the brightest, biggest, most accomplished, successful, however you want to term, term right. it, have had the same exact upbringing. Yeah, you know? and, and don't get me wrong. If I had to do some things all over again, I, I, would, I would apply myself to do it a better job with my studies. But I always knew that I would do good at whatever I would put my mind to. Unfortunately, when I was younger, surfing just took over so much of my decisions and what I wanted to do. So I literally would surf like, you know, all the time and ditch school. And like I said, I barely graduated, but at some point you have to grow up and then you have to make the choices and the decisions that you have to make in order to make something happen. I was always entrepreneurial, not really knowing that I was going to be where I am today, but I always knew that I was going to, I was going to be okay. That's great. 
It's a great story. Alex Abad, thank you for joining us on the Digs Influencer Podcast. Wish you continued success, my friend, and uh, we'll do this again soon. Thanks, Warren. It's a pleasure being here, man. Appreciate right it. And that wraps up this episode. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you found some value. Please share, subscribe, and leave a review. Find us on iTunes and your favorite podcast provider. Until next time. 